singing praise songs to our Lord Jesus.
everyone. It is the truth. All the glory goes to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to slow down a little touch and sing a few more songs.
Dear Lord, please keep our hearts and minds focused on you, that everything truly can be well with our soul, because we have the, the promise to be with you in paradise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> is coming up. Isn't that exciting? It's almost here. And hopefully my dream is that Bill will dress up as the firefly. <laughs> Mark's like, it's my dream too. That's, it's a good dream. But uh, just to make sure, there's a VBS meeting after church today that will have lunch. Uh, if you guys are wanting to sign up and do something for VBS, please show up. It'll be awesome. Uh, VBS is so much fun for a lot of reasons. Uh, but, like, the main one is just watching all the kids, like, like having so much fun and learning about God. And, like, it's just really cool to see all the different stations and them interacting with him in different ways. And Savannah does such a great job with it. I mean, last year was awesome. I loved it. Uh, my middle schoolers, it was fun because, like, they were not super, like... Some of them were like really engaged and the other ones were like, I don't want to do the song and dance. <laughs> but Savannah got them to actually start like singing with stuff. And I was like, whoa, these kids, they, they started getting competitive when the little kids were louder than them. And then they were like, no, we can't, we can't do that. <laughs> That's the, the middle schoolers. It's like you get them to do like competitive and then they're all about it. But yes, the, the meeting is after church today, and it'll be about an hour. Savannah doesn't like long meetings, so we'll be good. It won't be forever. I'm sorry, Bill. I mean... <laughs> um, so we did our movie night at Contra Costa Cinema yesterday, and it was so fun. Um, we watched Prince of Egypt, and it was like epic to see it in a theater, because I'm not old enough to have seen it in a theater like Mark. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, I meant old. <laughs> no, but it was really cool. It was awesome to see it, especially when the Red Sea is split. Like, that part was so epic, like, just seeing it in a theater. But it was really fun, and thank you, Zach, for letting us go there, and we cleaned it up very nice, and I didn't, I wanted to tell them to throw popcorn on the ground, but I didn't. <laughs> um, thank you. See, that's the mature part of me. Ma Mark was throwing popcorn at me the whole time, so. But that's why it was Max. Yeah, it was. It was because of him. <laughs> no, he, he threw popcorn first. He knows it. Um, so the other thing is the Chosen Watch Party is still going on Tuesdays at 6. Um, they are now going into Season 2. So you might be a little behind, but I mean, if you've read the Bible, you probably know what happens. So you'll be good. <laughs> Uh, and then there is a woman's craft day on Saturday, May 4th from noon to four. Um, and let Sharon know if you need childcare, but it will be provided if it is needed. Uh, and the mother's day luncheon is Saturday, May 11th from 11 AM to 1 PM. There are, um, are the sign up sheets still in the back bill, the sign up sheets in the foyer. So there's sign up sheets for that on the foyer. If you were planning on going, Make sure to go sign up. Um, another thing before I forget, uh, if you guys are interested in leading or serving communion, um, contact Liz Phelan for it. 
Um, we need more people to be involved. It's an awesome time where you get to reflect. I mean, you guys see it every Sunday, and you guys could be a part of it. So if you are interested, please let Liz know. Um, there's an email for it. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but yeah, if you are interested, please let her know. Uh, it's awesome to be a part of, but uh, we need more people. So make sure to make that happen. Um, and I think that is all for me. Um, we are going to enter into a time of communion. And kids, you guys are excused to your classes. Good morning, everyone. We're going to do communion in a minute. And uh, so if you haven't been here before, we usually partake of it as it's being passed. And then you can put the cups in the little pockets on the chairs, on the back of the chairs, and we'll pick them up later. Uh, so I'm the kind of person, maybe you are as well, that in order to better understand something, I like to know what the motive is. I recently read a book by Christian author Justin Lee called Torn. And without getting into the details of the book, because my time up here is limited, it's his basically autobiography about how he grew up, active in a loving church family, very loving parents, no dysfunction, trauma, or drama in his young life. He was a good student, respected, and popular. He committed his heart and life to God and the church as a child. All his growing up life, all he wanted to do was serve God, serve the church. He saw himself as a pastor when he grew up. God and the church was and is his first love. And then as a young adult, he couldn't deny any longer that he was gay. Yet he never acted on these feelings. He loved God and the church more than his same sex attraction and he knew there were others like him. It wasn't a sin simply to be born this way. Who could he talk to for some guidance and clarity? His parents loved him unconditionally, but were clueless how to help. And were, honestly, they were afraid for him. They were all afraid of the church. The church as a whole said, just don't be gay. Or you're kind of not welcome here. Love the sinner, hate the sin was the resounding gong. Pastor Tony Campolo once wrote in a response to the term, love the sinner but hate the sin, he said, Jesus never said that. Jesus said, love the sinner and hate your own sin. He knew in his search for answers that he could help others as well. While attending Wake Forest University, he did a deep dive in the scriptures. One of the results of his work is this book that tells the story of how he very bravely faced the task of attempting to rescue the gospel from the Christians versus gay debate. It's a great book, great story, and has helped many people inside and outside the church community, including myself, to understand a different perspective, a more loving perspective, a more Christ-like perspective. This was his motive. This was his motive, to share with the church body who claimed to believe that love is the most important commandment, but that like an arrow not reaching its target, they were falling short. It was also Christ's motive when he engaged with lepers, he dined with tax collectors, prostitutes, Gentiles. He didn't judge them, he loved them unconditionally. He wanted to show the Pharisees that they were falling short. If I intentionally block someone from hearing the gospel or judge them to be unworthy of receiving God's grace, that's a sin. James 4, 17 says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. I believe the good they ought to do referred here is loving our neighbors as ourselves. When we seek God first and love as God intended, everything falls into place. The fruits of the spirit will flow through us without reservation. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. Jesus doesn't fall short. His love is complete and hits the mark. So much so that he paid the penalty of his sins with his life. Like a friend snatching the dinner bill away from you and saying with a smile, I got this. He paid off our sin debt for us. The original pay it forward. Pure grace, pure love from its pure source. Our love falls short. 
even when we think we're doing our very best. So let's open our hearts and mind to his love this morning and forever. I think that's the true motive. Let's pray. Dear Abba Father, we your bride, we love you. Help us share our love with others. And we just thank you this morning for this cup of juice and this broken cracker that we take in remembrance of your body that was broken for us. And we thank you that you rose again and that one day you will come and take us back to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Lord God, thank you um, for everything you've given us, Lord. Um, Lord, in this time, as we give back, Lord, uh, give us wisdom uh, as a church, how we can spend this money 
and uh, give us wisdom in our families, Lord, how, uh, you know, how we can use the resources we have um, the way you want us to, Lord, as we're led by the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to have you back. How how was the uh, I I kind of you know made fun of you a little bit last week. Um, not not a lot, not a lot. Um, how was the eclipse? How yeah? How was my birthday? Yeah, there's the eclipse on your birthday. Wow. Wow. Very ominous. <laughs> <laughs> the clouds opened up. It looked like it was going to be cloudy, and then all of a sudden. The clouds opened up, and we saw the corona the whole four minutes. And uh, the airport was just absolutely stacked, crowded, and everybody was giddy. Everybody was, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what does the corona mean? Oh, it's when, the, when it's dark in the middle, and then the light is around. Oh, okay. So mm. and when the moon completely goes, because we were at Dallas, so it was 100%. And uh, so the... The moon covered the, all the sun, and you can look at it with your bare eyes for only four minutes. And uh -oh. the rest of the time, you have to have your glasses. Wow. So is your next communion going to be on that, the one that you missed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. We will look forward to it. So did I miss it? Was I supposed to do communion? You were. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I never told him this week. Well, I mean, there, there, there's a transition to your credit, and, and you didn't get reminded. So, <laughs> And I knew you were going to be gone. I should have. It's my fault. My fault. It was next week. No. Anyway. All right. Well. Sorry about that. All right. Well, welcome. We are kind of, we're, we're digging into a new series on everybody's favorite subject, sin, right? We just, <laughs> well, as I say in my, that little slide there, and their life-giving responses, and really that's more of the point. So, Let's see, where should we start here? Why don't we start by standing up? I think everybody needs to stand up, you know, jumping jacks, get some blood flowing, you know, stretch out a little bit. Say good morning to two and a half people, and then we'll get started.
<laughs> All right. The time to say good morning should only take, um, I don't know how long. I'm sorry, I just love people more. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right. Well, today we are, we are going to look at the, the sin, one of the seven deadly sins of pride, and then its response being humility. Um, you know, Peter and James, they... They both kind of reference this verse out of Proverbs uh, in a similar way. God opposes the proud, but he gives favor to the humble, which is an important, important uh, aspect to this, this, this theme, this subject. A couple weeks ago, so we heard from Jameson last week, and uh, he talked about similar, uh, really in some ways, uh, to the, the sin of pride. He talked about inflated ego or having your ego get too much uh, of the driving force in your life. Uh, if we go two weeks ago, we had Easter Sunday. Uh, the message was once and for all, or once for all, just emphasizing that Christ's resurrect, his death and resurrection was for, for everyone. And, um, and that he came to give us a regenerated life, uh, an abundant life. Um, at that, in that message, we looked at Peter um, you know, that was kind of the main part of the sermon, looking at Peter's uh, reinstatement, that Peter was, you know, a- denied Christ three times, and he was asked by Jesus if he loved him three times. And so, just to remind you, those three, three of those four questions were, do you love Jesus? Is that where you're at today? Is that where your heart is at? What is your response? If Jesus was sitting here asking you, do you love me? And if he asked you that three times, what would it do to you? How would it affect your own experience, your own following of him? And then, um, and then the question, the fourth question on Easter was, what's next? Given the resurrection, given... Do you accept that? Do you uh, are not sure yet? But given if you do accept it, what's next for you? How do you follow that up in your life? And so some of the next steps we looked at is how would you rate your love for Jesus today? Do you have any goals or missions uh, tied to your mission, tied to your faith? And what can you do to pursue a more abundant life? That message was kind of a lead in to what we're doing here with this series on uh, the seven deadly sins and life-giving responses, thinking about what gets in the way of our abundant living. God wants us to have abundant lives, a lives that are full, and he wants us to finish well. He wants us to finish every day well. He wants us to finish every circumstance well. He wants us to finish our lives well. There's a, so we, we are going to look at these seven deadly sins. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about kind of where they come from in a moment. Uh, but let's use this verse as kind of our primary verse for our message. And um, it comes from Hebrews chapter 12. And it comes right after uh, the writer of Hebrews. We're not really sure who it is, but he lists all these amazing people of faith and we call it the hall of faith chapter 11 of hebrews and he follows that with this 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 verse these three verses i want to say but uh he says therefore since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses all these people who have gone before us we understand you know our understanding of this since we're surrounded by all those great people of faith this cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
So God wants you to finish well. Each day, each circumstance or situation or event, and all the way to the end, all the way to the end. He wants us to finish well. It, um, I, I use this same example a couple, of we, a couple of weeks ago on Easter, that idea of performing when it's the hardest, right? And so like in baseball, we all love baseball, right? Everybody loves baseball. I have to re- reference some sport on every, in every message. Um, but in baseball, you have a closer. And so at the end, if the A's are winning, um, and they've won a couple, of, I'm going to jinx them now, but they've won a couple of games recently. And uh, th- they have uh, a closer come in, this guy that, that finishes out, and that's when the game's the hardest. The, the guys are really geared up to hit, and it's the hardest for the pitcher to really button it down. But it's, you're not going to get the win unless that guy comes in and shuts him down, Right. Also, just in sports in general, we have clutch players, guys that can, and gals that can really get it done when it means the most. Well, that's what we're thinking about here. When we think about these sins that can trip us up and the life-giving responses that can give us that abundant life, there are some hard places we find ourselves, some ways that we have to say yes or no and it's just not always e- easy. We need to be clutch, clutch players. We need to be good closers and be able to, to stand up, to step up to what's in front of us. As we dig in, let, let's pray. Join me in prayer. Father, as we consider this, we consider this race that you've given us to run. Each of us as individuals, we have this, this faith that we're living out, that we're growing in. We want to live abundantly we want to finish well guide us in this pursuit lord help us to uh to be able to step up to whatever you have us uh to endure whatever we need to go through and just help us to stay close to you in that in jesus name amen all right so um let's see what's what is sin and that's a uh, you know we're told in, the, in our verse that we need to throw off the sin that hinders us and easily entangles us. Well, I, I did find in the Bible project that we have a good description of sin. There's actually a few words, and so we're going to play that video, There's, and we'll probably play all three of these eventually. They refer to the other two biblical words that talk about They call them the bad words of the Bible, the bad words of the Bible. So first one is on sin. Are we ready with that? All right. People assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards, This is really unfortunate because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity describes behavior that's crooked, while transgression refers to breaking trust. And sin, this is actually the most common of these bad words in the Bible. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. Sin translates the Hebrew word chata and the Greek word hamartia. The most basic meaning of sin isn't religious at all. Chata simply means to fail or miss the goal. Like when the Israelite tribe of Benjamin trained a small army of slingshot experts, they could sling a stone at a hare and not chata, that is, fail or miss. Or there's a biblical proverb that warns against making hasty decisions because you're likely to chata your way, miss your destination. So in the Bible, sin is a failure to fulfill a goal. But what's the goal? Well, on page one of the Bible, we learn that every human is an image of God, a sacred being who represents the Creator and is worthy of respect. And so in this way of seeing the world, sin is a failure to love God and others by not treating them with the honor they deserve. You can see this idea in the famous code of conduct given to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. Half of them identify ways you can fail at loving God, and the other half name ways you can fail at loving people. 
And the fact that both kinds of failure are combined shows that failing to honor God is deeply connected to failing to honor people. This is why in the Bible, sin against people is sin against God. Like when Joseph refuses to sleep with the wife of Potiphar, he says, how could I sin against God? In Joseph's mind, failing to honor a human made in God's image is a failure to love God. And so, sin is a failure to be truly human. But there's more. A fascinating thing about sin in the Bible is that most of the time that people are failing, they either don't know it or even worse, they think they're succeeding. Like when Pharaoh wants to build Egypt's economy and protect national security, in his mind, this justifies enslaving the Israelites. He thinks it's good and he's totally unaware that it's an epic fail. Or when King Saul is chasing David around the wilderness trying to kill him, he thought he was bringing a criminal to justice until he realizes he's the corrupt one. And he says, I have sinned, I am the failure. So sin is about more than just doing bad things. It describes how we easily deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. So why are humans such bad judges between moral failure and success? Well, the first appearance of the word sin in the Bible offers an insight. There are these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Their parents had just given in to this beastly temptation to redefine good and evil by their own wisdom, and now Cain is faced with a similar choice. He's jealous and angry that God has favored his brother, and so God warns him, if you don't choose what is good, Chata is crouching at the door, it wants you, but you can rule over it. So in these stories, sin or moral failure is depicted as this wild, hungry animal that wants to consume humans. And we know how that story ends. The Bible is trying to tell us that failed human behavior, our tendency towards self-deception, it runs deep. It's rooted in our desires and selfish urges that compel us to act for our own benefit at the expense of others. And it leads to this chain reaction of relational breakdown. This is why in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes hamartia as a power or a force that rules humans. In his words, we are slaves to sin. He even says sin lives in us so that the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. So with the word sin, the biblical authors are offering a robust description of the human condition. It's a failure to be humans who fully love God and others. It's our inability to judge whether we're succeeding or failing. And it's that deep selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. This is not a pretty picture of ourselves, but if we're honest, it's realistic. This is why in the Bible, the story of Jesus is such good news. He's depicted as the creator become a truly human one who did not fail to love God and others. That is, he did not sin. And yet, he took responsibility for humanity's history of failure. He lived for others and he died for their sins. And he was raised from the dead to offer them the gift of his life that covers for their failures. Or in the words of the apostles, he committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. And that's the story behind the biblical word for sin. So, you know, they define right at the beginning of that um, video, they give us a simple definition of these two. You know, what gets translated sin in the Old Testament is the, the Hebrew word, and then in the New Testament is hamatia. Ha ha hamatia, is that right? Um, and so that gets translated sin for us in the New Testament. The meaning is this, to fail or miss the goal. And we've said that many times. In fact, I think I started the year with that, you know, making, uh, you know, the, the target and the darts and, and saying, really, just missing the mark is the definition of sin. And so God has given us a goal. He's given us a goal of how to live. And when we miss the mark, we are guilty of sinning. And so there's, there's lots of lists, and we'll look at, at some in the Bible, but uh, I want to remind us of where the video brought us as well in this important verse in Romans 6.23. Throughout the book of Romans, uh, you know, and throughout the New Testament, but Paul is really uh, explaining how, yeah, we're sinners, but God also sends his grace. And so here we have the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the grace of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.
And so that's why we cling to the cross. We believe in the work of Jesus to help save us from our sin, save us from our wondering, our inability to hit the goal or, and, you know, our failings. So we're going to look at this list uh, called the seven deadly sins. And I think, um, I guess I don't have another picture of that. But where did that come from? And it doesn't necessarily come directly out of the Bible. It actually comes out of, uh, from a pope, Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century. So isn't that, that's like the 500s, right? 6th century. I always get confused by that. Yeah, the, yeah, the 19th century was the 1800s, 20, yeah, okay. Anyway, um, so it was a long time ago, but he composed this list. And what these actually are, are their um, offenses against love. And so that's how he, you know, he, he put together a list for the, the church at that time. And that's kind of right toward the beginning of the Catholic church with the big C. Um, meaning that Catholic kind of means unified church, means all together. So sometimes you'll see it referred to with a small C. But with the big C, it kind of means the Roman Catholic Church, right? And so we have this list, and, and, you know, it could be a question, why use the list? Well, I think it gives us a good overview of sin. And we want to start with pride. Uh, many have said that, that pride is actually the, the framework or the foundation of every sin. It's actually what is most systemic to what trips us up is this, uh, this, this thing that we call pride. So first of all, as we enter in here, the first point is understand the primary source of all my sin. Now, if you look there in your sermon outline, I have this, uh, this verse uh, where Jesus is, you know, they're, they're, he's battling the Pharisees a lot, right? Uh, and, and they're saying, why don't your apostles wash their hands? you know, like they're supposed to, ceremonially, ceremonially. And Jesus makes this point, he went on to say, it says where we pick up, it says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and defile a person. So like the, the video made this point as well, there's something in us that wants to sin. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever heard that the devil made me do it? Anybody ever heard that? Well, that's not true. Now he might tempt you but James also agrees with Jesus here and says that it's your own evil desires that trip you up. They drag you away and entice you and can cause actual death, maybe literal, but maybe spiritual, or maybe just in that moment. Have you ever been your own worst enemy and made a bad choice? Nobody here? Probably nobody here. But we do that, right? We, we have this innate desire to do, like Paul, the video referred to Paul, he says, sometimes I do what I don't want to do. Have you been there? Yes, you have. I'll answer for you, okay? So we have this autopilot. Um, and here's what we do a lot of times. We say, I'm just not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to act pridefully anymore. I'm not going to be greedy anymore. I'm not going to lust anymore. I'm not going to be jealous or envious of anyone anymore. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stop. Well, here's what, the, what's what Jesus says on that. Sometimes when we do it, it comes back twice as strong. Have you noticed that? If you focus on denial sometime, have you ever tried to diet? And you focus on not any, eating and all you want to do is eat chocolate. You know, you say, I'm not going to eat chocolate. And then you focus, and, and it's just like powerful, right? That I'm just, that's all I want now. Well, that's a good example of other sins as well. When we start saying, I'm just going to not do it. 
So what do we need to do? Well, we need to replace it. We need to replace because we have this autopilot and, you know, if you think of autopilot, and I've, I've used this example, it comes from Rick Warren, but you could, if you had a boat that had an autopilot, you could force it to go this way and you force it and, it, and, and, and you hold on to it and it can go that way and then if you let go, it just goes right back to where it's going. Well, because of that, we need to replace some of these bad habits with good habits. And so when we use God's help in this, he'll help us exchange pride for humility. Or he will exchange, it will take away the pride and help us put in humility. He'll take away the envious desires and put in kindness. He'll take away the gluttony and help us put in self-control. That's the help we're looking for. And I think that there are, there are ways to kind of help us along as well. The class we're doing upstairs, when we think of uh, everybody always, the point of that is helping us to, to encourage each other and hear examples of how to reach out to people that we might tend to shun or ignore. And when we do that, we we'll build humility in our lives and we're helping replace our pride with humility. Um, now pride, what is it? Excessive belief in one's own abilities. That's a good way to, design, to, to define it. An excessive belief in one's own abilities. Sometimes we think of pride as getting a big head, right? And, and that's, that's true. It's like thinking too much of yourself. The Bible says we shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we ought but think of ourselves with sober judgment. So if you take like, um, you might wonder, well, what about some of the other sins that aren't even on this list? And so one example might be like racism or prejudice. But if you think of racism, if that's the issue, the ingredients um, that make up that recipe are pride. Pride is one ingredient. Uh, ingredient because pride says I'm better than that person. Pride is kind of the main ingredient in racism or prejudice because it makes you think that I or, or maybe my race or my background is better than somebody else's background. If we look at, now some have said this list of seven deadly sins kind of comes a little bit from Proverbs 6. And it's not direct. But when you look at what is written in Proverbs 6 about what the Lord hates, it says haughty eyes. So that's kind of pride, right? A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush in to evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. So when you think of a list like this, I see a lot of pride there. Because I see a lot of focus on preserving oneself and just taking care of oneself rather than looking at the people around them, rather than looking at the larger community. So pride occurs when I think I am better than someone else. When I think I'm better than the people around me. When I think I have all the answers and when I don't think I need God in my life. And that's the ultimate expression of pride is when we think we can make a better decision than God can. That's the ultimate uh, expression of pride. I... I do want uh, acknowledgement for making my own little uh, picture here. I could not find pride. Thank you. Thank you. It took a while for me to expand humility out enough for it to actually look good. Okay. I just appreciate it for a moment. I want us to remember, as I've said, that I in the middle, right? 
That's key. That's key on both accounts, I think. But especially on pride, what makes it bad is that you're focusing on self-preservation. You're too much focus on I, right? And so we need to take us out of the factor more to be in God's best, to be in God's good graces, so to speak. I've thought about the idea of pride uh, and uh, one interesting comparison is cholesterol, all right? And so I'd, have you ever heard that there's both good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? Anybody heard that? Yeah. I remember years ago now, I'm an old man now, but when I was a young man, I had a te blood test and I had high bad cholesterol. But then I also had high good cholesterol. And when I went to the doctor, they said, you're good, you're good, all right? Um, and I did have a blood test recently and it seemed to come out okay. Uh, so cholesterol is this waxy substance found in your blood. And the LDL, take notes on this, okay? No, <laughs> LDL cholesterol is bad and then the HDL cholesterol is good. Um, and I thought, well, what? And so the LDL makes, it, it's, it gives fatty buildups within your, uh, within your veins, right? And so it causes blockages that happen in your veins. What the HDL does is it takes that back, to your liver will process that, and that's apparently what needs to happen. And so the good stuff, it takes some of that, not all of it, but it will take some of that back to the liver and get it processed. So it'll help clean out your veins if you have good cholesterol. And I guess they both come from food, and I don't know all about that stuff. But I thought that was interesting because pride is not always bad, right? It's good to take pride in what you do. It's important to think about... Um, doing a job well and doing your best at it. And we will use that and we'll use pride as saying, I want to do my best, right? It's wrong when we make ourselves Lord or God in the midst of that. Our own mindset, our own ways become too inflated, then pride becomes a problem. And we become, you know, we're, we're kind of taking the place of God in our own lives. So, allow the good pride in your life to help clean out the bad pride, okay? Being that maybe you take pride in the Lord himself, and we'll get to that, that point. Acknowledge my problem with pride. So, part of that is just admitting, you know, admitting that you're, you can be proud, you could be prideful at times, right? Uh, Proverbs 11, 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Have you ever heard pride comes before a fall? <laughs> yeah. So common in our culture, right, to say that. Have you ever seen that happen? Have you ever felt that happen in your own life? You're like, oh man, I spoke too soon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, back to the sports, you know, just the, the silly examples, but you can kind of get overconfident. And you can't, you, you know, uh, you, you, gotta, you gotta do the fundamentals, right? You gotta be ready. And so life can catch you off guard and somebody, you weren't expecting it, you know, and, and somebody kind of, trips you up and then, you know, you weren't ready and pride gets the best of you. Um, Proverbs 3, 10, 13, 10 says, um, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Wow, wisdom is found in those who take advice. So pride can lead to conflict, right? Um, and when you think of, you know, when you think of marriage, <laughs> you can end up with a lot of uh, conflict because you always want to be right. And then that would be the essence of pride. You, you're, not willing, you're not willing to listen like you should. 
You're not willing to give what needs to be given. Um, I could use... I, I could use a lot of examples, but I didn't get Sharon's, uh, you know, I didn't get Sharon's permission, and I, I, I'm always right, so <laughs> it would make her, you know, <laughs> you know, when I'm, when I'm doing premarital counseling, uh, it, it's, it is interesting to emphasize the idea of listening to each other, and I think when we talk about, get, you know, replacing our pride with humility, it is often about becoming a better listener. Now, 1 John 1, 9 says this, and this is part of how we clean out that bad cholesterol, how we clean out that bad pride. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just. Forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It is with confession. We don't, we don't have to, you know, you know, I don't know how you clean out your cholesterol. You eat better, Right? I don't think there's any quick fix for it. I think you've got to have better habits, better discipline, and that's part of what happens to happen in our spiritual life. But also confession is, is, is like God says, okay, it's out of here. And so we confess it, and God gets rid of it. And he begins to change our heart in the way that it needs to be changed. Um, and one way to, to define confession is, is to agree with, agree with. And so when we confess, we agree with God and we say, yeah, I, I was not on the right track there. I agree with you, God. I agree with you, God. Help me get back on the right track. And so then it allows us to come back toward humility when pride has taken over in a certain circumstance. Now I want to take a time out here for a moment and talk about pride versus confidence. Because like we already said, there's a good form of pride. And sometimes you might think of, well, that person's just confident, right? And that's a good thing. I needed a confident person to be beside me. Now, others might see them as arrogant, but they were just confident. I think of Peter in this way. I think of Peter amongst the disciples where he's willing to stand out. He's willing to step out. And he was a confident person. And God needed that personality. The, the other disciples, I think, needed Peter to help them move forward as well. Have you ever been in that circumstance where you needed somebody beside you that was willing to step forward, willing to be confident? Again, it comes back to that I. Are you obsessed with yourself? Do you like the attention? Is it about you or is it about doing what God has called you to do? So then we, we, we bring that in the light. Confidence in and of itself is not pride, right? God has empowered you guys with a lot of different gifts. To use your gifts is not being prideful. To use your gifts confidently is not being prideful. But when it becomes too much about you, and you know, I think another word that we could look at here is uh, arrogance. And in our culture, um, I don't think we ever use arrogance positively, right? So we use pride positively, and we use it negatively. Arrogance is always over the edge, right? It's always too, too focused on, you know, building up one's own situation or reputa reputation or reputation. I don't know. I think, I think I've used all my words up. All right, so here's, here's the thing uh, about all of this, is we need to be better listeners and willing to adjust. When God gets our attention, maybe through somebody else, we listen and we adjust, right? We make adjustments toward humility and away from pride. Finally, so we have, let's see, we have understand the primary source of my sin is pride. Acknowledge my problem with pride and then humble myself before God. Um, like I said, this is replacement. We're trying to replace our pride with humility. And humility is pride in God. It's when you take your pride that you want to keep for yourself, you take it and you put it in the one place that it's proper. And that's put in God. Humility is pride in God. 
You say, God, I'm proud of you. So that's what we want. That's the goal, right? Is to be able to take that pride and point to our Heavenly Father. I think um, this next verse, sorry, I didn't, uh, this verse in, in James 4, like the one at the beginning was from Peter, kind of says similar things um, there. James writes, he gives us more grace that we need, and that's why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. We want God on our side, right? We need God's favor. And so we want to live our lives in that way, and then he gives us some good practical ideas here. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God. He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. When we enter into that mentality, we're able to do that replacement ministry that we're talking about. And the goal is to have decreasing pride and increasing humility. I know you can't see that, and uh, so I have a better one here that's still kind of hard to see, but I can see it on stage here. Um, if you look at a list like this, it can. what I want you to do is maybe look through that and say, where do I need to be challenged here? Where am I maybe being too prideful or too proud? So I just found that I didn't make this. I found this. Proud people focus on the failure of others. Humble people are overwhelmed with a sense of their own spiritual need and constantly realize how far they fall short. Proud people are self-righteous. They have a critical fault-finding spirit, look at their own life faults through a telescope, but others through a microscope. Are com and then humble people are compassionate and forgiving. They look for the best in others. So you have a list, and, and you know, we see that you might be challenged by that. Like, you know, I read through that and I go, yeah, I can fall into that sometimes, Right? I can fall into that critical mindset that isn't humble, that's the opposite of humble. You may not want to admit to being pr proud, prideful, I think is the best way to say it maybe, but I can see sometimes my responses aren't humble. They aren't being God in this moment. Um, there's one more list I found here that, that tied it more directly to verse. I, you know, I saw verses all over that other list too. Um, but the big points here, humility exalts God uh, and others at the expense of self. Pride exalts self at the expense of God and others. So that's clearly through scripture what we see. Humility gains what it does not seek. Pride always loses what it seeks. Jesus talked about, you know, taking the lower seat and then getting elevated rather than taking the high seat, that sort of thing. Humility draws God's favor. Pride draws God's opposition. And that's, you know, what that proverb, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. My prayer for us is to be able to see some places that we might be prideful. In a, in a negative way and replace that with humility. We want the worship team uh, come up and again, God wants us to finish well. God wants you to finish well. Each day, each circumstance, situation or event, all the way to the very end. Um, some of the thoughts for uh, next steps. What is likely to trip you up, cause you to sin? especially in the area of pride as we think today. And how do you see pride slip into your daily life? Where is it likely to slip in for you? And what is one act to stimulate humility into each day? Maybe it's coming before God's word. Maybe it's uh, praying for people. Uh, 
Maybe it's praying for somebody. I think that's partly why Jesus says pray for your enemies. That develops humility in you and where you can think of others, elevate others. So why don't you stand up and um, let, let me pray for us here. Father, as we consider um, pride, Lord, show us where we need to change. Help us to know how to do that, how to put humility in where there, there might be some, some uh, negative pride, some arrogance. Lord, just uh, encourage us and challenge our hearts in the way they need to be encouraged and challenged right now. And Father, we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.